They are giants traveling our shores, enduring the longest migration of any mammal. Gray whales were almost extinct, then bounced back and thrived. But recently, they began to disappear again by the thousands. Join the Cousteau team as it investigates the obstacles this unique whale faces, from Baja to the Arctic. It's Jean-Michel Cousteau, Ocean Adventures. This is summer in the Arctic, where thousands of grey whales are now arriving. It marks the end of a long migration by the whales we drove to extinction in the Atlantic, then managed to save in the Pacific. The Cousteau team has come to the top of the world to see what these Arctic waters can reveal about this marathon whale. Grey whales have fought to exist, but recently, one third of their entire population mysteriously disappeared. The team will investigate why, starting with what we think we know about grey whales. Unbelievable. That was pretty. They migrate 12,000 miles round trip from here to Baja, seven months without food. Finally, the famished whales return for a feast found only here, or so we think. They're the only whales that feed on the ocean floor, and they seem to always feed on the right side. In the Arctic summer, the sun shines 24 hours a day, fueling tiny plants for tiny animals on which the whales feed. It's a feeding ground the size of Switzerland. Nice foggy day to make a dive in the Arctic. To get a first-hand look at the whale's food, the team will collect samples of mud from the ocean floor. I'm going to take four coarse apples off there, all right? So once you get out, you bury them in the mud in the bottom, one cap on each end, stick them back in the bag. Do all four, four different areas. Plowing the muddy bottom to feed, gray whales create underwater trenches and alter the environment more than any animal except the elephant. The water is near freezing. Visibility underwater will be zero. Don Santee sits this one out. Yeah, good day for an old uh, beach party. Just me and my friends, the polar bears. Well, it was black and it was black. You could feel the dips in the bottom, though. Big trenches of whales. Were there? Right yeah. there, so we were in the right spot. Whoa, there you go. Yeah. Now that is an amphipod. That's what I thought we would see up here. A lot of work to get a good sized meal out there. And the whales need a ton a day. Thanks a lot for getting rid of the sediment. Yeah. Because uh, I have some really cool organisms here. You have these huge gray whales feeding on these little critters. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, ten amphipods. So amphipods were the dominant the, species. The, the, the majority of the actual biomass in that sample. Yeah. The amphipods, which are the known main food of the gray whales, will eat anything. Gray whales have no teeth. Their bottom jaw is just gums, but all along the top jaw, they grow plates of what's called baleen. Baleen is just like fingernail, made of the same material, keratin. These are the baleen plates. There's one right here, and then another one, and another one, and another one, all stacked up, hundreds of them. And that's the outside. That's right. And when they feed, and they bring in large mouths full of water, and then they close their mouth, and they use their tongue to squeeze the water out through the baleen. These types of critters right here are amphipod, 
with land on there. And the very last part of feeding is that when this material is stuck to the baleen and the water is out, then the gray whale uses its tongue to lick off the critters. Could the sudden disappearance of a third of gray whales in two years be linked to their food source? Or could it be obstacles along their migration? To find out, the Cousteau team will meet the whales at the southern end of their migration and then follow them back to the Arctic, along the only coastline in the world where they continue to thrive. It begins a world away where males, females, young and old, come to mate and give birth, and maybe just to play, in the lagoons of Baja, Mexico. Fourteen crew members aboard the research vessel Beauport of a busy three-week expedition ahead. Magdalena Bay is where they will begin to track the whales in protected shallow waters, more suited to gray whales than to the ship. You right now, this is where I was in three feet of water. What did he say he was in three feet of water? Yeah. The Beauport obstacle course. <laughs> Fifteen feet. Uh, that could be a final anchorage spot, but see how it looks on your chart. <laughs> yeah, that looks good, Don. The whale too. Jeez, it's a good. Oh, everything's happening at once. Are you ready to go diving? Yeah, man. Get the water. Although it is believed that the gray whales only feed in the Arctic, whales are spotted off a shallow sandbar in what looks like feeding behavior. Matt Ferraro and Blair Mott will enter these nursery waters to check it out. Hey, I'm looking forward to getting the water at those whales. They find a seafloor without food for whales, confirming the whales are not here to feed. Matt then discovers a patch of whale skin, a clue to the true activity going on here. Gray whales can be infested with up to a ton of parasites attached to the skin. This is a rubbing beach, where the whales can at last scratch. On the shallow sandbars, the sea breaks into waves, and the whales have even discovered how to body surf. Baja may be more than a whale nursery. It may also be a spa. In these tranquil lagoons, gray whales were almost hunted to extinction. But 70 years ago, were protected from whaling. Don travels north to San Ignacio Lagoon, where protection has led to the only place in the world where any whales regularly approach people. Ready to go? Well, before to go, are you gonna give you a bracelet? Oh. And this you you have to wear this because that means that you are in a natural protected areas in Mexico. How long have you been a Ponga driver here? This is my 23rd season driving boats in World Watch. What will we see when we go out there today? Breaching, spy hopping, mating, many different behaviors. Okay. In 1972, normally elusive gray whales suddenly turned friendly and began to approach boats. There's her eye. And they haven't stopped. Yeah, she's uh, moving the boat a bit with her nose. But there seems to be a lot of power in her head. She's just moving the bow of our boat around with her head. Amazingly, the mothers bring their babies. Baby? That was nice eye. Yeah, there's the eye. Nursing on milk that is 50% fat, the calf will double its weight before reaching the Arctic. Seven months after birth, it will part from its mother and have to fend for itself. Well, they're pretty accommodating, huh? They were right there with us. They didn't mind us at all. And the baby was just playing, just laying there playing. But even in these idyllic waters, a protected World Heritage Site, nothing can be taken for granted.
San Ignacio was recently threatened when a major corporation and the Mexican government wanted a massive salt mine project to improve the economy. Cousteau and others objected. Good environmental policy, 100% of the time, is identical to good economic policy. What the promoters of this project are saying when they're talking about good economy, they're talking about treating the planet as if it were a business in liquidation, converting na our natural resources to cash as fast as possible, and having a few years of pollution-based prosperity. And, and, of course, that can generate an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy, but our children will pay for our joyride. Efforts to stop the salt mine were successful, and for now, the lagoons remain safe. Once the whales leave for the Arctic, they travel hidden below the surface, except to breathe. So the team welcomes experts in satellite tagging to follow the whales from space. Hey, hey! How you doing? Ready to tag some whales? Oh, yeah. yeah. Good, good. Are they close by, or...? Uh, unless we need to sit down and talk about them. OK, so we're here, so we're and then here. you're wanting to... Whales, they, they move with the tide. High tide is at 6, 30, something like that, mm -hmm. in the morning. So we have to be ready very early. Designed not to harm the whale, the tags are challenging to attach and unpredictable as to how long they will stay in place. We, um, from scratch, design the transmitter, build the transmitter. The, the antenna has to be exposed, and you have to be able to contact the satellite. Doing that three times or more within a 10-minute window allows the satellite to determine the latitude longitude of the whale. The steel ring, stainless steel ring, keeps it from penetrating into the whale on the surface tissue. Oh, oh, oh. I typically like to shoot 30 to 45 degree angle to the body. I, I get some leeway by shooting them lengthwise. So if I make an error because of the waves, it's not as critical. But ideally you want it a little bit higher, but it didn't go in too deep oh, though, I'm right? Well. There they are. One o'clock. Okay. No drop! No drop! No drop! Jean Michel. John, is that you? Hey, I got a little update. What's going on? We had uh, two fantastic days of tagging no, here. We've uh, tagged that? four whales. Well, I'm, I'm uh, very pleased, and uh, I guess uh, now that the scientists have done their job, uh, we're going to be able to track them and uh, see uh, how much uh, trouble they find along the way. Thank you to all, and uh, we'll be in touch uh, tomorrow. Bye now. Bye. All right. Yeah, look at this. These are the two first two whales that we uh, tagged. These here are the GPS coordinates from the Argo satellite. Oh, wow. Here's the 10th wow. GPS. So it's well, basically... On, that whale's on its way north. It's on its way north, so we should probably start moving ourselves. Mothers and calves are the last whales to leave the lagoons, waiting for the calves to gain strength. They face thousands of miles ahead, swimming without stopping. The crew continues to monitor satellite signals with backup from short-range VHF. But within days, only one signal remains strong as the ship heads north. The ship reaches San Diego. A threshold to the densely populated California coastline. All tags stop transmitting, possibly rubbed off by the calves or on the sandy bottom. The team must now proceed with their backup plan, which is to follow the whales the hard way, connecting with experts, waiting and watching. The mother whales will hide going north, seeking protection for their calves in the contours of the coastline. There is an entire industry, though, dedicated to finding them. Worldwide, whale watching is a $1 billion business in 90 countries, with over 9 million people learning about whales. How, how big do you think it is, the gray whale? 20. 20? 
that's a pretty good guess. Feet? 45 feet long. Oh. So that's a pretty big one. And the baby is around 12 feet. Is that right, ma'am? But the gray whale has evolved to hide. South of Los Angeles, the team finds experts at watching. This is the ACSLA, American Cetacean Society, Gray Whale Census and Behavior Project. We'll be out here on the cliffs of Palos Verdes from December 1st through about May 15th, depending upon how long the whales are coming through. We're the only full season Gray Whale Census in the world. Also the only Gray Whale Census staffed entirely by experienced volunteers. We uh, work very carefully with the National Marine Fishery Service and they do the official census up in Central California to actually determine how many gray whales there are. We work together and look at our trends and see how closely they match. The two key things are the timing of the migration. Are they on time the way we'd expect? Are they early or late? Which could reflect a problem with the environment or feeding. Um, and also how many calves are surviving. And this year we're seeing healthy whales, fat whales, lots of calves, which really makes us feel that everything's going just fine. I noticed that there's some uh, oil rigs that are inside uh, Long Beach Harbor, mm -hmm. and there's plenty of oil rigs up in the Santa Barbara area. Are those impacting the whales at all? Well, we have those out here too, and I would have thought that the oil rigs might scare whales away because of the noise they make, but gray whales tend to torque their migration to actually go through oil rig lines, so I think they may actually use them as a point of navigation. Oh, really? Well, we use the uh, oil rigs for navigation to get back and forth to the islands, too, so I guess we're as smart as whales then. <laughs> Swimming constantly, the whales cover up to 80 miles a day. As they pass Piedras Blancas, south of Big Sur, they are again being counted. What's special about this site is that the cows and calves will just come in right next to us here. You could hit them with a potato as they go by, they're so close. In 94, we took gray whales off the endangered species list. So my agency, the National Marine Fisheries Service, was obligated to be sure we were making the right decision. Uh, the first year, we had a good solid count of calves. The next year, it kind of tanked out, and we had no idea why. So we've been continuing the counts, and we found that there are really wide fluctuations in reproduction that we think are linked to environmental conditions in the Arctic. The adult females that are calving, they're going through this long migration, lactation, and then another long migration without feeding. So physiologically, that's, that's pretty tough. Now this is a vertical photograph of a gray whale cow-calf pair. And you can see how sleek this female looks. I mean, she's really kind of narrow looking. And, uh, if you looked at this same animal when she was migrating southbound in December or January, I mean, they're just real fat and robust. Then naturally she's got a calf inside of her, so that makes her shape wide also. So we photograph southbound animals, see how wide they are relative to their length. Then we also look at northbound animals with calves. By doing this, we can compare year after year after year. And what we found was in 1999 and 2000, when we had real bad years, that overall gray whales were much thinner than they were in good years. So that allowed us to think that what happened in those years was related to nutrition. So controlled at the feeding station. That's right. What's important to gray whales is what happens in the Arctic. That's where they feed. But in Monterey, California, it's killer whales that have come to feed. And they've been waiting. Nancy Black is an expert on killer whales. And her research links their high numbers in the area to the seasonal presence of gray whale calves. Jean-Michel and his team have come here to better understand and possibly witness the most intense natural obstacle that gray whales must encounter. Okay, what do you guys think? Killer whales or gray whales? Where do you want to go? You mean they're not together? No. Let's go for gray whales. Okay, pass down. Uh, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Right, right next to us. Got it, got it. Oh, here we are, under the surface. Yeah. There we go. That's a baby. That's the, That's the baby. More calves have been counted this year than ever before, perhaps rebounding from the decline of 1999 and 2000. But as research shows, more calves also means more killer whales. Morning. Hi, guys. If you are, could come alongside this way, 
the gray whales are a really important food source for the killer whales, especially at this time of year, because one gray whale calf could feed up to maybe 20 to 30 different killer whales. They might eat a lot in a short period of time, and then after you know, the gray whale season, then they're looking for sea lions or dolphins or other animals. So you know, it's probably um, a healthy thing for them to, to feed so much on all these gray whales right now. It's an important thing for their culture to teach their calves how to hunt these large whales because it's pretty difficult. They have to coordinate with each other and most of the adult females are involved. And while the females are attacking the gray whales, the calves are right in there observing what's going on and they'll need to do that for the future. So it's always it's been a natural thing that the killer whales and the gray whale interaction probably for you know thousands of years. And okay, we're gonna go to the other side of the grid. So you're taking us to your favorite whaling spot. Yeah, yeah we'll head across we're, the main of the canyon. We, we want to see action. Okay. Lots of action. When the gray whales leave Point Pinos, which is the southern end of Monterey Bay, before that they're hugging the coastline, traveling right outside the kelp beds of the shoreline. But when they get to that point, then they have to start crossing Monterey Bay. Very few of them take the long way around, so they tend to take the route that goes across the bay and puts them over the canyon. And the killer whales come in to patrol the canyon. They, that's how they find the gray whales over the deep water, because we think they're listening for the gray whales. Does it appear they're taking a shortcut? It looks like they are going to cut across the bay. Across they're not going to go inside. Maybe a big mistake. These whales have lost the safety of the shore as they enter deep waters. The Cousteau team struggles to track the elusive whales and their progress. Do we have a heading on that whale? Yeah, trying to move up there, boys. Boy, cameramen are actually Don's favorite. Get a little closer, get a little farther away, go a little faster, go a little slower. You know, can you make the sun go away? Can you make the sun come out? <laughs> hey, Matt, I need to, uh, can't see anything now. Okay, well, neither can I. We got killer whales that are at 3 o'clock right here. We have okay, we got, you got 1 o'clock, you got something. You got 1 o'clock, but that's The team spots an attack, an event rarely witnessed, even by researchers. Yeah, a little calf. Where is mom? It will be a life or death fight for the calf as its mother tries to defend it, even coming to the boat for protection. And the mother does all she can to protect her calf. The mother tries to keep moving towards shore while the attack is going on, because if she gets close enough to shore, then they can escape in the surf line or the kelp. That one just jumped on top of the calf. When they do that, they're trying to hold it under to drown it. And then the other killer whales, I think there's about 12 in the group there, kind of circle around, and the young ones are learning how to hunt as well. Underneath us. Underneath this guy. One of their best strategies is trying to separate the mother gray whale from its calf, and then they can really focus on the calf, bashing the calf from the underside. When they do that, a lot of it causes kind of internal injury and the killer whales will surround it, and one will come from underneath, the others from the side, another from the front. The calf is continually rolling. That's their best way to keep the killer whales from hanging on to their pectoral fins or their tail flukes, is to continue rolling as much as they can. They're cooperating underwater. One is maybe holding the carcass and the other ones are, are stripping the blubber off of it. They don't really compete or fight when they're feeding. They, they seem to work together. Man, did that happen fast or what? Unbelievable. The female just grabbed the carcass and is just towing it under. She's she, using her tail flukes there to propel her to 
pull thousands of pounds underwater. And we've seen chunks of blubber that are almost like squares. They're just like really cut almost perfectly. Yeah, to see this amount of killer whales, it's amazing, not only out here, but anywhere in California. That once in a lifetime experience. In some years, we might just see one attack for the whole season, and some may not even see an attack. Well, the 2004 season was really unprecedented. We've never seen anything like that as far as the number of attacks on the gray whales in Monterey Bay. We knew about at least 16 attacks, and of those, four of them escaped, and 12 were actual kills. Possibly as many as 30% of the gray whales born could be killed by killer whales. But right now, it seems to be kind of a check and balance, because when there's fewer calves born, then we see fewer attacks and fewer killer whales in the area. One third of the calves won't survive the trip north, due to many causes. But in the cycle of life, nothing goes to waste as life passes from one form to another. The calf's carcass will feed countless animals, large and small. Well, the old rule of ecology that there's no free lunch has a flip side, and that no lunch goes uneaten. So when you have a population that comes back, like gray whales have, to be as abundant as they ever were, um, that's going to be taken advantage of by predators on gray whales. And certainly it looks like killer whales have figured out the timing, mm. the precise timing and the routes. We've heard people mention that the killer whales are just killing the calves just for the tongue. It certainly seems to be a preferred part. Also, by tearing out the tongue, the animal will bleed to death very quickly. So it may be a kill technique. But once the animal's dead and bled out from the tongue being removed, they can strip the blubber and other parts of the animal underwater where it's less conspicuous. Why do you think that the uh, eastern gray whale population has been so strong in coming back? We knew exactly what habitats gray whales occupied. And the League of Nations protected them in 1935. And then when the IWC came along, they continued that protection status. And the Mexican government closed off the lagoons to whalers um, as a part of that blanket protection that League of Nations extended. So knowing the habitats is really critical to being effective in a conservation measure. That's part of what's missing for most other large whales that are endangered. And where, when gray whales become sexually mature, the female's giving birth to a calf every other year. That's the highest reproductive rate we know of any of the large whales. Other species have it harder, I think, than gray whales in terms of their ability to come back from uh, very depressed numbers. I am pretty awestruck by these animals. And now, when we're getting the good things that can really help promote conservation, we're going to be instrumental, I think, in making it possible for these species to recover. That's personally gratifying. Um, where did you get that hat? I want to get one just like it. <laughs> <laughs> For the gray whale population to continue to recover, they need a dependable source of food. Farther north, a discovery is made that changes what we know about gray whales. Carrie Newell has unveiled the secret of Depot Bay. They like us. That's what makes my work fun. It's amazing. You do this every day, and your enthusiasm is amazing. Incredible. Because they're always different. You never know what they're going to do. Because they knew we were here. Oh, yeah. Came to check us out. Lost them now, though. For some whales, the migration ends here. Jean-Michel and his daughter, Céline, joined the team in Oregon to investigate. This is a place where whales stop. And are they called resident population? Well, this is a population that... Um, we do term here in Depot Bay as our residents, and what part of my PhD study is trying to figure out how many of these are consistently coming back year to year. I think because they're finding an ample food source here, you know, they don't have to travel that extra. Instead of doing a 10,000 mile round trip, you know, they're doing a 5,000 mile round trip, so they don't have to travel that extra distance, and you know, they don't expend the extra energy and everything else. To prove her theory, Carrie must identify specific whales that stay to feed here and return every year. So far, she has documented 56 residents. The T 
team will experience firsthand the stages of an unexpected discovery. Two outbound depot bay, two outbound. The entrance to depot bay consists of a narrow and often turbulent passage. Just getting in and out of the harbor can be tricky. Search began with wondering why the whales were hanging out in the kelp. We're back in the kelp, right here, yep. right here, yep. Yep. right there, it's coming up. Yeah! Oh, 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 that cool? <laughs> it took a simple test to find what the whales already knew. Oh, I hope we got mice. <laughs> we got mices. <laughs> Look at them, though. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, these are the cute ones, too. <laughs> no, we have two species. Those are cute ones. <laughs> yeah, they're my favorites. So that's what's sustaining these resident gray whales here off the Oregon coast. It's, it's really amazing. hard to believe that such a huge animal feeds on these little tiny things. Oh, I know. Our team reported to me that you got totally excited when one of the whales pooped. Oh, it pooped! I, I gotta get it! Right there, right there, right there. there go. I gotta get my net. Oh my goodness, yes. When I first began this study, I was watching the whales, and it's like many times they're in the kelp. It's like, okay, what's happening? So I went over to the kelp, jumped in the kelp, found these huge swarms of mice and shrimp. I said, Eventually, they're eating mice and shrimp. If the mice are here and the whales are here, you would assume that's what they're eating, but you don't know for sure. Whale! Yeah, right here! Everyone along the coast, you know, everyone was saying, no, they're eating amphipods, they're eating amphipods, but no one had really looked. It was just an assumption, because that's what they eat in Alaska. It was a good assumption, of course. So I wanted to say for sure that they were eating those mice and shrimp. So when we saw the, the whale release its fecal material in the water. There it is. Good. Just, to, I need to run through it. I just took the plankton net and scooped it up. Took it back to the lab, looked at it. Sure enough, there were mice and shrimp fragments. It'd be cool to see all these on the screen. What is it that uh, they don't digest? Usually, um, parts of the carapace, parts of the, um, you know, like crabs have the external skeleton, so bits and pieces of that. But also the tail, the talson with the uropods, the way you can identify the species comes through in the excrement. And so I can tell you exact species that they're eating because that tends to come through quite well through the digestive tract. And so once, once you have that, that can say, yes, this mm. is definitely what they're eating. I mean, I'm sure the mice and swarms have all, always been there. The gray whales were probably always feeding on them, but finally we're making that connection. So mice are very, very important toxicity studies. I mean, if we would have a whole bunch of pollutants dumped in the water right here, they are so sensitive to pollutants that they'd all die. All of a sudden, the mice are gone. You know, we're going to probably have problems. No whales. You know, the rockfish will suffer. The salmon will suffer. The economy at the coast here will suffer. So everything's interconnected. I mean, we're so dependent in Depot Bay on the ocean here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Bunch of whales, got mice. It's a pretty productive day. I understand you've seen a whale here that has a appeals to have been shot by a harpoon, an explosive harpoon. Exactly. Scarback. She has a huge chunk missing. And in 1985, she did not have the scar. 1987, she did. And so I. And survived. And, and then the, came back here. Yeah. And the wound has not healed. I mean, I've taken pictures of her every year for the last 12 years. 
So I've been able to look at the wound over those years and it, it looks exactly the same from the first time I photographed it in 91 until this year when I took pictures of her. She has had three calves in the amount of time that I've seen mm -hmm. her. Um, and the males are still attracted to her, even though she has this huge wound. It's um, right around her dorsal hump area. They aimed a little bit too high, thank goodness. But um, Do you think whales are attracted to each other because of their look? <laughs> Scarback definitely has had lots of males around her, so we've seen her mating here with males. So, I mean, the wound doesn't have seen doesn't seem to have deterred any males from her. But maybe, I, the, maybe the attraction comes from maybe. within. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> we'll never know what makes a whale beautiful, but the work of Dr. John Kalambokidis shows that every gray whale is visually distinctive. As a result, each can be studied over the course of time. We actually have over 6,000 identifications we've made of these gray whales and we have collaborating research groups up and down the coast that have helped gather that data. This shows this photo ID technique of identifying individual whales. Using natural markings, it's been used on species like blue whales, killer whales. It's a technique developed in the 1970s. And in addition to using the sides of the whales like this, you can also use the tails. This is the tail of a gray whale and it has distinct markings on it. Well, these are some of the identified gray whales that uh, we track and we actually keep these rubber banded together. This is the left side of an animal and this is the right side, okay. the same animal. And all of these photographs in this pile are the same whale. So we can actually see different times and places that this animal was seen. By identifying individuals, researchers have confirmed that resident whales range from Northern California to British Columbia, a small part of the larger group. You know, the whole gray whale population is estimated to be from a high of 26,000 to about 17,000 are the recent estimates. And this seasonal resident group is a very small portion of that. So it's only a couple of hundred animals. They tend to feed on different things than uh, the animals in the Bering Sea. You see them feed on things like ghost shrimp, swarms of these mycid shrimp, and they seem to do pretty well at it. We have an estimate of a survival rate of over 95% year to year. So showing a very good, healthy survival rate. And that was especially surprising in 1999 and 2000. We had this major mortality that might have wiped out a quarter or a third of the overall gray whales, but these seasonal resident gray whales did just fine. These resident whales might survive if conditions in the Bering Sea and their food source there should change. But by feeding in Washington state waters, they've encountered a new obstacle, people seeking to feed themselves. In 1999, the Macaw people of Washington state invoked treaty rights of 1855 and killed their first gray whale in over 70 years. Their need was explained as largely cultural. This was sustenance for fading tradition and ancient pride. It was also highly controversial. In 2002, a federal appeals court suspended the hunt until the impact, especially on resident whales, was better understood. When you consider the very modest number of animals they were looking to kill, up to five a year, that clearly wouldn't have an effect on a population of 20,000 or more. But if you're talking about a population of a couple of hundred, uh, you potentially have an impact. Following the Macaw precedent, 17 other tribes have applied for permits to conduct a hunt of their own. Ongoing research to know what the population can sustain and what else might diminish their numbers has become even more critical. This is a whale that washed up dead, and after we kind of pieced the skin back on the animal, we saw it was the same animal, and you can line up these same marks here to here. These lines connect the same marks on this dead whale and the live whale. So we were able to figure out this was a whale we'd seen alive, and then it ended up washed up dead on the beach. This animal actually became tangled in a gill net. Well, I'd like to look at the wraps a little, a little better around the tail to try to judge how this occurred, but my guess is it would have most likely occurred with the animal alive. It's about a 25-foot 
male juvenile gray whale. It looks like it's been dead one to two weeks. It has very little skin left. Uh, it's tangled and looks like maybe more than one type of gear, but I can't quite tell how it became entangled yet. It's clear this gear has been in the water a long time. It's got quite a bit of growth on it. They must just get in and spin around or wrap themselves in there somehow, because you'd almost have to, you know, spin yourself into that to get caught with them. But obviously, they do a that is, good job. That is the typical response. Yeah. Even when they get in nets or anything like that, they start to get tangled. Yeah. Oh. On rare occasions, intrepid rescuers have discovered and freed a fortunate whale from a tangle of nets. The others drown unnoticed and uncounted. While John continues his work on what can be seen, the team continues north to an increasingly dangerous obstacle, one that is invisible. Everything we do as people that impacts the ocean eventually impacts whales. So it's really changing our lifestyle to know that out of sight, out of mind doesn't work in the ocean. It's not the silent world. In fact, it's the noisy world. These whales have adapted over millions of years to use sound to perceive their environment. Humans actually produce lots of sound in the water. And so we do lots of things in the environment that we're just starting to realize we better find out what is the impact of this because it impacts not only the marine mammals, but the fish and the birds, the seals, the sea lions, etc. I put you right in the center of the whole shoot match. Is he shipping lane? Yeah, you're, you're right in the middle of this. Let's take a drop here. We can pull all our radio mics down, isolate the hydrophone, and then just give a good, quiet listen and see what we have. Matt, give a listen to this. It's so loud. It's a lot, huh? This is beyond, this is such a surprise to me. Yeah, check this out, Blair. It is pretty it's impressive. It's blow your mind, man. In the last 10 years, there has been an increasing focus on a new form of environmental pollution of the oceans, and that is acoustic pollution, sound, generated by lots of different activities, from underwater explosives to high-intensity military sonar to oil development, commercial shipping, intrusive scientific uh, research, even. Some of the things that we've learned are frightening. We know, for example, that high-intensity military sonar has the potential not just to interfere with behaviors or to injure, but actually to cause stranding and death. In 2003, an incident involving mid-frequency sonar was recorded at Harrow Strait, Washington, by scientist Ken Balcom. The coast looks serene, but Ken and his assistant describe an intense drama underwater involving killer whales as the sonar is turned on. Here. I guess the Coast Guard's looking into it. They know nothing about it, and they're trying to talk to the ship. This is nuts. I think they're hurting these whales. Hey, John, this is Ken. Uh, can you guys get your Navy to shut that sonar off? I'm afraid we might get some dead or deaf whales out of this. Stop. The U.S. Navy is seeking global deployment of a new, longer-range, low-frequency sonar called LFA. And the good news is that we were successful at getting a federal court to block the global deployment of this system. The bad news is that this is just one system, and the Navy is just one military, and there are militaries all, the, all around the world that are not only testing these systems, but they're, they're deploying them. The frequency and intensity of all obstacles challenging the gray whales, including sound pollution, diminish as they finally pass the last of the densely populated coastlines. Continuing north and around the Gulf of Alaska, gray whales reach the final stretch, passing through the Bering Strait to a remote sea protected in its isolation. In this ancient seasonal cycle, the famished whales replenish themselves in a feast that lasts the entire Arctic summer. My name is Bill Gita. I'm born and raised up here in Barrow, the northernmost community of North America. A lot of 
people have been misled, saying that uh, where we live in the tundra, it's a, a very barren ground, uh, when actually it's a, a very pristine and very beautiful place. The waters off Point Barrow once sustained an entire culture. Our understanding is that you were maybe the last gray whale hunter. It was hard. It was hard life. People went whaling sometimes in a bad year with not enough food, you know, for the, for the, fam for the families when they went out. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're trying, trying to collect food for the winter. If winter, these animals are not here. When the whale come up at you, then it, it will just go right at you like he's, he wants you to be, it, it wants to be taken. Even if you make noise, they'll, 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 they'll just keep coming, coming like they want it to be caught. You hit them, you shoot them, and you get them. They make, they make it look so easy, you know, to, to, for them to be caught. Sometimes if they let that uh, harpoon just drop, just drop like this, so it, and, and they just let it go like that. The whole harpoon will just drop right here at, at the neck. And then it, just turn over. Whale seems to know that uh, these whalers are really compassionate, that treat people with love, feeding them. Anybody else hunt the gray whale farther east or farther west of here? In Russia. Uh, Russia? The Russia quota, I believe, is about 135 gray whales a year. Uh, Aboriginal whaling is, is going on now in Alaska, in Greenland, in, in Russia, um, in the Caribbean. And it's incredibly important for many countries that don't have the luxury of being able to, to grow cattle. They can't farm or they can't ranch, that they need to hunt, hunt in order to survive. I think that that whale populations can sustain, biologically, they can sustain a harvest. The real issues are, are ethical issues, and do people think that, that whales should be hunted or not? It's a, a decision that, that the world needs to make on whether this is an appropriate action to, to take um, for a resource that, uh, that really belongs to, to the world. But gray whales may be most threatened by the world outside the Arctic in the form of global warming. The Arctic is the end of the line in terms of cold temperature, and so it's here that the consequences of global warming are most dramatically experienced. We've seen a lot of change as far as the ocean, uh, the, the retreat of the main ice pack and the main ice pack breaking up, and uh, uh, we are facing some erosion problems due to the rising temperature of the ocean. Oh, you know, everybody talks about global warming, but. Up here on the edge, well, you can really, really see it. You know, it's been a dramatic change in the last last decade. Geez, we had, you know, polar bears get off the ice there, and the ice went back out, and all of a sudden we had like 80 or 90 polar bears get wow. off in 12 miles of town for several months. We're not seeing the ice year-round like we used to. You know, so the, I believe the ice is melting. Uh, the ice you remember is, the ice all year long here? Oh, yeah, I remember when I was a kid, uh, the ice being up here all year round. Uh, we would lose the ice maybe for two or three months out of the year, and uh, the ice would come back. But there's a few times where maybe the past five years, we've had open water all year round. But that's good. I like global warming. If that's what you're... Why do you like global warming? Because it's warmer. Mm -hmm. because, because it's warmer, but what's happening Because with... Because we, we burn less gas. Less gas. So you're saving money. Men, money. When you don't have money, not much money, like some of the people, people out there now, it's it's something that that is going to help our communities. Don't you think the polar bear needs the ice to survive? Yeah. They so can, they, does that they, mean the polar yeah, bears they, are they, going to disappear? They can go north pole where there's a lot of ice still out there, you know. Yeah. They're stranded because there's no ice, no, no and, ice. They, and it's too far away. Yeah. So that's a problem. Yeah. Well, definitely there's a, a great concern, I think, among the whole marine mammal community about how vulnerable marine mammals would be to global climate change. Uh, because even fairly small changes in ocean temperature can mean tremendous differences in what's available. And I also think of all the areas that gray whales have been studied, probably the least studied area is their food supply in the Bering Sea.
and it clearly, with this mortality event, showed how little we knew about that. Over the last three decades, global warming has added to a 30% loss in the Bering Sea of the gray whale's main food. We now know that warmer ocean temperatures mean less food for gray whales, and that one third of them died in 1999 and 2000 because they were starving. It really does scare me more than any other single thing, uh, you know, how climate change could have just drastic effects on many of these marine mammal populations. Big yeah, turn. He just did a new turn. Yeah. Oh, oh it's on his back. The numbers of whales and whale populations are not growing, but what's growing is the number of hazards that these species have to encounter and surmount in order to survive. And I think the, the Pacific coast um, is, uh, just epitomizes what that problem is. It's clear to me there isn't one threat, you know, but as you're exploring, this is really more kind of death by a thousand cuts. There are many different threats that all add up. The use of military sonar is on the rise on a global basis. The thirst for petroleum is increasing. As however many ships we have today, that number is only going to go up. There are probably a thousand variables out there that these gray whales have to deal with in this obstacle course, as Jean-Michel identifies. We need to continue studying and learning more about the gray whale population, but we have to protect them today. We can't afford to wait until we have more perfect information. It's remarkable that it continues to survive. I hope it's all positive for the gray whales. The goal is very simple, is to get um, all people aware of what's going on, of the work that is being uh, put forward, and uh, have our decision makers making better decisions, and have uh, the public uh, awareness uh, put more pressure, so to support science, to support regulations, to make sure that we uh, ultimately pass on to the next generations something hopefully as good, uh, if not better, than we found it. Jean-Michel Cousteau Ocean Adventures The Gray Whale Obstacle Course is available on video cassette or DVD. To order, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Retrace the gray whale's yearly migration and meet other unusual undersea creatures. Go on your own ocean adventure at pbs.org. <laughs>